Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is bargaining over the bomb. This is the first lecture in our unit on nuclear negotiations, and it represents a bit of a shift in our disciplinary tactics as well. The course began with a discussion of physical science and how to actually construct nuclear weapons. After that, we moved to a more historical approach, talking about just what went on during the nuclear era. Here, we're phasing into a social science approach. We want to test the generalizability of some of those historical narratives and see if they muster any real theoretical weight. And it makes sense to start our social science inquiries with nuclear negotiations, given how important they are to modern political narratives. Let's get to it. The first step is asking whether nuclear negotiations can work at all. That is, can an opponent of a potential proliferator offer concessions, have that potential proliferator accept those concessions, and then in the long run, not ultimately develop nuclear weapons? If you watch enough cable news, you might think that the answer is no. But if you remember back to some of the previous lectures, we already have examples where it is the case that nuclear negotiations have worked. Take South Korea as an example. The United States offered South Korea military deployments, economic aid, and assistance with its civilian nuclear infrastructure in return for South Korea not developing nuclear weapons. And that has worked over the long term. We've also seen tensor relations between Argentina and Brazil blossom into a friendly partnership. Part of that was predicated on their nuclear negotiations, and indeed the integration of their two civilian nuclear programs to give more assurances about that friendship. Although it took a while, we've observed Libya come to the negotiation table eventually and give up its nuclear program. And most recently, we've seen the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action pause Iranian advancement in its program. Of course, with this one, it remains to be seen how long that's going to last, especially with recent political developments in the United States. We've also talked about how negotiations, perhaps not directly related to nuclear weapons, can nevertheless have an effect on nuclear proliferation. When Israel gave substantial concessions to Egypt, much of Egypt's motivation to develop nuclear weapons disappeared. And perhaps as a result of that, Egypt never really progressed past nuclear exploration. Putting all this together, the real question isn't, can negotiations work? It's, why do negotiations work? And if we have a better grasp on this why question, we'll also be able to make progress in understanding when nuclear negotiations will succeed and when they will fail. So that's what we're focused on here in this lecture, and what we'll be focusing on in part throughout the rest of this unit. What I'm going to be doing now is essentially covering the main argument from my book, Bargaining Over the Bomb, The Successes and Failures of Nuclear Negotiations. If you're interested in the more technical details, you should check out that book. There's a lot more complex game theoretical models that I discuss in there. What my goal is for this lecture, however, is to give you the overview of what's going on. So you have a general idea about the incentives at play and why we can get negotiations to work. With that methodological caveat aside, let's take a look at the situation I want to analyze. Suppose that we have two states that are engaged in a zero-sum security relationship. They really don't like each other, and they agree on basically nothing. You can think about this as there being some sort of policy out there that's in dispute between the two of them. And if one state is doing better in terms of this policy, the other state must be doing worse. This would appear to be a bleak situation, so we're stacking the deck against the feasibility of successful nuclear negotiations. The other assumptions take seriously the notion of anarchy. The second assumption says that there is no inherent credible commitment to not use nuclear weapons. In other words, if I develop nuclear weapons, I am free to use them to coerce you and get more stuff for myself. This is a central assumption that's built into most constructs in international relations. In a domestic politics situation, you have court systems and police forces that can enforce agreements between parties. 
Here, we're not going to have that. If I say in an early phase, I am not going to use nuclear weapons against you, don't worry about it, there's no need to fight a preventive war against me, I am not going to be forced to live up to that promise. Because once I have nuclear weapons, it might not be in my interest to follow through. I might want to use those nuclear weapons to acquire concessions. And so we're building that sort of threat into the model. The final assumption details what happens in pre-nuclear negotiations. If an opponent offers a potential proliferator a batch of concessions designed to induce that potential proliferator not to build nuclear weapons, then the following thing can happen. The potential proliferator can say, thank you very much. I'm going to enjoy these concessions now. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to build nuclear weapons anyway. Once more, this is taking seriously the notion of anarchy. If an opponent wants to get a potential proliferator to accept the deal, then it must be the case that the potential proliferator is happy with that deal and prefers taking it over having the enjoyment of that deal in the short term and building a nuclear weapon anyway. It's also taking seriously some policy concerns, especially in the United States. If you listen to US rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Iran and North Korea, there is this central concern there, that the US maybe shouldn't be offering any concessions to North Korea or Iran because it's not going to affect what they're going to do with their policy, and it's just going to cost the United States something in the meantime. All told, these assumptions are stacking the deck against a deal, and despite them, we're still going to see a deal work. Other than those assumptions, we're going to be looking at nuclear negotiations in a vacuum. That means we're going to suppose that there is complete information, meaning that the opponent knows the potential proliferator's nuclear capacity, they know the potential proliferator's willingness to develop nuclear weapons, and the potential proliferator knows its opponent's willingness to fight a preventive war. Why are we making these assumptions? Well, if you think about what appeared on the previous slide, those are incentives that one might say are central to nuclear negotiations whereas having incomplete information is not central to nuclear negotiations. It's more of an extraneous thing. That's not to say that the world is always full of complete information, and there's no uncertainty around us. In fact, later on in this unit, we are going to relax the complete information assumption and see situations where there has been incomplete information empirically, and we'll also talk theoretically about what happens under those scenarios. But because complete information is sort of a default case, and we don't want to have extraneous moving parts to the model and extraneous bargaining problems when we're trying to answer a central question about why nuclear negotiations work, we're going to begin in this vacuum and then eventually work our way out of that vacuum. Along those same lines, we're going to assume that there is perfect monitoring, meaning that the opponent observes if the potential proliferator is developing nuclear weapons so that it knows that now is the time to fight a preventive war or not. We're going to assume that there's a static nuclear capacity, so that if the potential proliferator chooses to build a nuclear weapon today, its ability to do so is going to be exactly the same as it would be tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. And we're finally going to assume that there is a static preventive war capacity, meaning that the opponent's ability to fight a preventive war today is identical to its ability to fight a war tomorrow and the next day, and so forth. Again, I am not saying that all situations with nuclear negotiations look like this. But what we want to look at at the start is a vacuum. And in a vacuum, we're going to focus on perfect monitoring, static nuclear capacity, and static preventive war capacity. And later on in this unit, we'll see what happens when we relax those sorts of assumptions. As one final assumption, we're going to have the states have equal patience. This one's a little bit more subtle than the other ones, so I don't want to focus too much time on it. But again, we'll talk later on in the unit about why this is important. With all of that out of the way, let's take a look at an overview of the game. The interaction begins with the opponent offering a concession to the potential proliferator. So they're starting off in a world where the potential proliferator has not yet developed nuclear weapons, and the opponent is trying to convince the potential proliferator not to. 
The potential proliferator sees that offer and then chooses whether to accept it, reject it, or build. Accepting implements the solution, rejecting leads to a war, and building results in the opponent having to make a decision whether to launch a preventive war or not. Like before, preventive war will end the interaction, but if the opponent does not launch preventive war, it's going to instead have to renegotiate the terms of the agreement, now with the potential proliferator having acquired nuclear weapons. It might help to condense all of that information into a diagram. We begin in the top left corner with the opponent making an offer. In response, the proliferator accepts, rejects, or builds. First two options end the interaction. Building then has the opponent choose whether to launch preventive war and also end the interaction, or pass. If it passes, it instead will make an offer, and the potential proliferator will accept or reject. Let me highlight what's happening in the payoffs for the game. If the opponent makes an offer that the proliferator accepts, then whatever that offer was proposed by the opponent will be implemented, and that's what they'll live with from now until the rest of time. If the proliferator rejects, then it fights a war under the status quo distribution of power. So this is, again, before it has developed nuclear weapons, so it's not going to have the benefit of those nuclear weapons in a war, but war is going to produce some sort of outcome, and because war involves killing people and destroying buildings and so forth, it's going to be costly to both parties. Things get interesting if the proliferator builds. Critical to what's going to be happening in a moment, if the proliferator builds nuclear weapons, it pays a cost to try to do so. That should not be a controversial assumption to build into a model, because we've talked before about just how expensive nuclear weapons are. They're quite pricey, and so we're building that into the model. If the opponent doesn't like the idea of the potential proliferator acquiring nuclear weapons successfully, its option is to launch a preventive war. We're going to assume that this looks very much like the rejection situation from the potential proliferator before. So we're getting war payoffs under a status quo distribution of power where the proliferator does not yet have nuclear weapons. But like I said before, it's costly to build nuclear weapons. So if you're the potential proliferator and you try building a nuclear weapon and the opponent just fights you, then any sort of capital investment that you've made on those nuclear weapons is just going to be lost. If the opponent passes, then we're going to have another critical change to the payoffs. Now that the potential proliferator has acquired nuclear weapons, there's a shift in the balance of power, so that if we have a war being fought into the future, now the potential proliferator is going to be relatively advantaged as compared to what would have happened had they fought under the status quo distribution of power before that power shift. After that, we have the opponent making an offer, and if the proliferator accepts, then the distribution that the opponent has offered is what will be implemented. But of course, the potential proliferator, having built nuclear weapons, will have paid the cost associated with that. It's a fixed cost, it's sunk, they can't get it back at this point. Finally, the proliferator could reject the offer in this post-shift phase. And if it does that, like I've said before, it has nuclear weapons. So in war, it's going to be relatively advantaged as compared to what would have happened pre-shift in the earlier phase of the game. However, still like before, the cost to develop nuclear weapons is sunk. So even if the proliferator fights a war, it is not going to directly recover the cost of nuclear weapons. It may indirectly benefit because it has more power, but it's still going to be suffering that cost of development. Just to take a step back here and give you an idea about why I've developed this course in the manner that I have, Everything that we've been learning in the previous unit are essentially assumptions that we've built into this model. There's a security relationship that's zero sum, weapons are expensive, they want something but not everyone can have it. These are all things that we've seen before as we were substantively talking about nuclear weapons and the thought processes behind developing those weapons. And now all we're doing is we're using a game theoretical model to aggregate all of those assumptions together and see what happens. So having put all of those things together, now let's actually see what happens. We begin with an interim result. If the opponent acquires nuclear weapons, the parties will reach an agreement. Why is that? Well, war is costly, and because of those costs, the parties should want to avoid it. To be able to avoid war, both sides need to be happy with the deal, 
And so the deal is going to be centered around the post-shift distribution of power. That's important because it's what's going to motivate the country to develop nuclear weapons in the first place. To visualize what's going on here, imagine that the opponent and the potential proliferator have a strip of territory that's in dispute. That's why they have a problem with each other. The opponent would like to draw the border as far to the right as possible, as close to the proliferator's capital, and keep as much of the territory for itself as it can. The proliferator has diametrically opposed preferences, and it wants to draw the border as far to the left as possible. So we have a dispute. Well, we can either have that dispute resolved peacefully or through war. Imagine that we have a war. Two things will happen in the process. First, at some point the war will end and we'll have some sort of border drawn between the two of them. Imagine in expectation that that border is right there. So the opponent is getting what appears to be a little bit less than the proliferator, but there's some for both. In practice, it doesn't matter exactly where we're drawing the line in between the two of them, Whatever we have as the expected distribution will still have the same sort of central result that I'm about to describe. The second thing that happens in war is that people die. The people in these countries don't want to die. This is a costly thing. This is something that they want to avoid. And so as a consequence of that, imagine that the opponent says to the potential proliferator, hey, I know that we're going to, if we fight a war, have a border that's drawn about here. Why don't we just agree to that border right now, not fight a war, and enjoy the peace? If we do that, instead of having people die, we'll have everyone survive. Both of us will be better off as a consequence. If either of us were to, instead of agree to this deal, fight a war instead, well, we'll have the exact same border being drawn in expectation, but we'll have people dying in the process. Neither one of us wants that, so let's agree to this. And that's why, after the shift in power has happened, the expectation is that we'll have a deal done. But importantly, the deal is going to be predicated on the potential proliferator's realized power. It's no longer a potential proliferator, in fact. It has nuclear weapons. And as a consequence, those nuclear weapons are going to be forcing the border closer to the opponent, giving less stuff to the opponent and more stuff to the proliferator. This is simultaneously doing two things. One, it's giving the proliferator an incentive to build nuclear weapons. And two, it's giving the opponent perhaps an incentive to fight a preventive war to stop the potential proliferator from developing those weapons. To recap this in terms of the game tree, if the opponent passes on preventive war, then what we're going to have is a piece that is going to be relatively advantageous to the proliferator as compared to what would happen in a world where the proliferator chose not to build nuclear weapons and we negotiated a deal based off of the status quo distribution of power. From here, we're going to have three different outcomes depending on the parameters. So let's go through them one at a time. First, suppose that the power shift is relatively large. In other words, by acquiring nuclear weapons, there is going to be a monumental change to how much power the proliferator has as compared to what the opponent has under the status quo. Well, in that case, the opponent prefers preventive war to passing on preventive war. Internalizing this, the proliferator does not develop weapons because it costs money to do so, and the project will ultimately fail because the opposing state is going to intervene in the meantime. And as a consequence of that, the opponent doesn't have to make any nuclear concessions to convince the potential proliferator not to develop weapons. It's still going to make some level of concessions because it has to stop the potential proliferator from just fighting a war. But the concessions are not going to be predicated on the ability to produce nuclear weapons. It's just going to be predicated on the status quo distribution of power. Recapping this in the game tree, the opponent prefers to prevent than pass under these circumstances. Recognizing that, the proliferator sees that it has a better outcome to reject an offer than to build, because if it builds, it's going to have a war fought against it anyway, and so it might as well save on the investment cost and just fight a war on its own. And then recognizing that, the opponent realizes that it needs to buy off the proliferator based off of its rejection payoff rather than its build payoff. And so it's going to offer an amount that is reflective of the status quo distribution of power, which is sufficient to convince the proliferator to accept.
Again, both parties are better off than if they fought a war because they're getting something like what war would produce, but no one is dying in the process. To better conceptualize what will eventually happen across the three outcomes, it may help to have a graph that visualizes each outcome as a function of two critical variables. On the x-axis, we have the cost to build nuclear weapons, and on the y-axis, we have the extent of the power shift. So if you tell me how expensive it is to build a nuclear weapon, and how much those nuclear weapons have an effect on the balance of power, this diagram is going to tell you what will happen in the outcome of the game. So things that are happening in the bottom left corner are representing situations where the cost to build is very cheap, but the shift in the balance of power is going to be relatively minimal. Whereas in the top right corner, we're on the opposite set of extremes, where the cost to build nuclear weapons is very high, but they do have a large shift in the balance of power. The first outcome occupies the top portion of this figure. You might think about this situation as a case where the opponent views a power shift as being too hot to allow. In other words, the opponent is calculating that the costs of preventive war today are relatively small as compared to the amount of concessions it would eventually have to give the potential proliferator once the potential proliferator has acquired nuclear weapons. You'll note that this does not factor in the cost to build. That's because the opponent's willingness to fight a preventive war is not dependent on how expensive nuclear weapons are. That is not something that's factoring into the opponent's utility function. It's just comparing how much in concessions it will have to give up versus the costs for war today. And so that's why we don't have this as a function of the cost to build. It's only a function of the extent of the power shift, and it's occupying this top part of the figure where that power shift is too hot. Now let's look at the second outcome. Suppose the power shift is relatively small compared to the cost of proliferation. Well here, the proliferator finds the ultimate payoff for developing nuclear weapons to not be worth the cost of investment. As a result, it has no credible threat to build. Internalizing that, the opponent makes no nuclear concessions. It recognizes that there aren't any circumstances where the potential proliferator develops weapons, and so it is going to base its offer off the status quo distribution of power, rather than what the power distribution might look like in the future where the potential proliferator has acquired nuclear weapons. Visualizing what's going on in the game tree, the proliferator is calculating that its payoff for building is worse than its payoff for rejecting. That's because the cost of weapons is relatively high here. Consequently, the opponent is focusing its offer based off of the threat that the proliferator might reject the deal. So it's going to be offering an amount that is commensurate with the status quo distribution of power. Interestingly, this outcome looks very similar to what we had uncovered with the first case. But the causal relationship is a different pathway. Here, it's the proliferator's unwillingness to build because of the expense of nuclear weapons that's causing the opponent to just offer an amount commensurate with the status quo distribution of power. Before, it was the opponent's credible threat to initiate a preventive war that made the proliferator not want to build under any level of costs, which in turn allowed the opponent to make an offer based off of the status quo distribution. Same outcome, different causal relationship. Plotting this within the figure, the too cold region is in the bottom right. We have a diagonal line here because how too cold is being defined is a relationship between the cost to build and the extent of the power shift. It's when the cost to build is relatively large compared to that power shift. So a very high cost and a very low shift in the balance of power results in this too cold region. Now looking at this figure, you might think to yourself, we have a too hot region, we have a too cold region. Well, that leaves this middle region as just right for proliferation. The balance of power is not going to shift so drastically that the opposing state prefers fighting a preventive war. But the power shift is large enough compared to the cost that the potential proliferator wants to build nuclear weapons under those circumstances. And yet what we're going to see in the third outcome is still no development of nuclear weapons. So imagine that the power shift falls in a middle range. The proliferator then has a credible threat to build. The opponent does not have a credible threat to launch preventive war. And the opponent 
realizing the circumstances, chooses to offer concessions commensurate with the proliferator's ability to develop nuclear weapons. It preempts the need of the potential proliferator to acquire nuclear weapons by making a proactive offer designed to convince the potential proliferator that the weapons are unnecessary. Going back to the territorial dispute might give you a better idea about what's going on here. Imagine that the opponent and potential proliferator fail to reach an agreement. They can both anticipate what's going to happen next. The proliferator, recognizing that the investment is worth the cost, will develop nuclear weapons. The opponent, calculating that the costs of preventive war are relatively high as compared to the shift in the distribution of power, will not fight a preventive war. So we'll have a successful power shift. At that point, the parties will renegotiate, and they'll end up with this division of territory between them. Imagine that you're the opponent, and we're not yet into the world where power has shifted. The proliferator has yet to choose to build nuclear weapons. You could say to the potential proliferator, hey, look, we know exactly what's going to happen if you develop a nuclear weapon. You're going to ultimately get this amount of the territory. So let me do you a favor. Let's just implement this distribution right now, straight away. If you accept my deal and choose not to develop nuclear weapons, well, you're going to keep all of your money. You're not going to have to pay for those nuclear weapons, and they can be expensive. And yes, you could decide to build nuclear weapons anyway, but if you do, you're only going to get this distribution of the good anyway, and it's going to cost you money. So you can get exactly what you want right now and not have to pay for it. Well, thinking about this, the proliferator finds that it's getting a great deal, and it's going to want to accept. Of course, the opponent can be a little bit more clever than this. Because the potential proliferator is not having to spend any money to develop nuclear weapons, it doesn't have to offer exactly what would happen in the post-shift state of the world. It can actually kind of narrow that down a little bit. The potential proliferator is still willing to accept perhaps not a complete concession because it's getting most of the concession and still saving on the amount of money it's spending. Thus, the opponent is making a deal that is commensurate with the potential proliferator's ability to develop nuclear weapons. The more expensive it is for the potential proliferator to develop nuclear weapons, the more the opponent can steal here. Whereas if nuclear weapons are essentially free for the potential proliferator, then the opponent is going to have to implement an agreement that essentially matches what would happen in that post-shift state of the world. Just to complete the figure, now that we have a situation that is neither too hot nor too cold, it's just right, but it's not just right for proliferation, it's just right for a deal to happen that's commensurate with the potential proliferator's ability to develop nuclear weapons. Wrapping things up here, even if we have an environment where two parties are in a zero-sum security relationship, and we have anarchy so that a potential proliferator can't credibly threaten inherently not to use its nuclear weapons, and a potential proliferator could take any concessions given to it and then build a nuclear weapon anyway, we still see that a deal is getting done. Of course, we've also seen other assumptions built into this model that are making nuclear negotiations rather frictionless. So what we're going to be doing for the rest of this unit is first looking into some of the statistical components of nuclear negotiations and see if one's ability to build nuclear weapons is in fact related to the amount of concessions that it's receiving. And then after we've done that, we're going to look more into the theoretical reasons why these sorts of negotiations would fail. So we'll relax all of those assumptions that we talked about earlier, and we'll see how under certain circumstances, once those assumptions are relaxed, we will not have a deal come together properly. Hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.